So it was easy to be grandiose in your ideas. It was easy to get carried away because everybody was being carried on a tide that seemed to be taking us all towards this incredible future, which of course has ended up in this complete dunce out, but uh, that's the way it goes. I think the story of Mike Oldfield is probably one of the most extraordinary sagas in all of rock music. I first met him when he was about 16. At the time, I was running a discount mail order record shop, and Mike was trying to get some interest in a tape of some music he put together. I knew him only as a top class guitarist who'd been on the road with musicians like Kevin Ayers, but apparently he'd been trying to persuade someone to believe in his musical ideas for years. We were all a bit broke at Virgin at that time, but we offered him the use of our sound studio, which was, and is, uh, in a rather grand house near Oxford called The Manor, and disappeared to work on his tapes. 12 months later, uh, we took the tapes to Midem, which is a terrible big international music sales conference in the south of France, in the hope of getting things off the ground. Fairly predictably, we could get no interest in it. One, one record company said it was a load of self-indulgent rubbish, and uh, they definitely wouldn't be interested. Another record company said that if they slapped a few vocals on it, they would give us $20,000. And, um, you, know, we, you know, we said that we weren't that desperate. And in um, any case, we came back to England having got no interest from outside England at all. Anything I can do is muck up his sound. Eventually, uh, we decided there was nothing for it but to release the record ourselves, which we did, giving it the number B2001. And then we thought that to launch the record, we would organize a concert of the music. But there was just one problem. On the record, there are some 40 to 50 instruments. Mike had played nearly all of these himself. Tubular Bells, with almost no promotion, began to sell faster than we could make copies of it. In fact, the sales were staggering. In England, it went straight into the charts, where it's been ever since. During the first six months alone... I don't know, his, his album sold about... Uh, it will have sold about five million albums by the end of the year, worldwide. And in, in England alone, a million, a million albums. promoting the record in America, Australia, or wherever. But again, there was just one problem. Mike had disappeared. As a result of the concert, it had something of a breakdown and had vanished to his parents' house, apparently to build a duck pond. So we were faced with a nightmare of a number one artist who would not be interviewed, who would not play in public, who would not travel, who just wanted to sit at home and compose. where he gets his musical ideas from. Although he learned a lot from a composer he met with Kevin Ayers, called David Bedford, who gave him records of Delius and Vaughan Williams. All his music is constructed with infinite care. He records each tiny segment himself on a multi-track tape recorder. On Tubular Bells, for instance, he overdubbed, that is, re-recorded, some 10,000 little sections. And on Omidorn, his third piece, he overdubbed so many times that he completely wore out the tape as well as himself, and had to start again. The mix that he's now got, and in which he's recorded the music for his new space movie, has given him slightly greater freedom. 
start with a raw sound. Go straight into the mixer. Equalise that. Maybe so it's a lot brighter. louder than the first note. Mike writes out a score, or normally writes out a score, just like any other composer. And then having recorded the different elements of his music, he just mixes them all together. One piece, which maybe lasts for 40 to 45 minutes, can take him as long as a year. Very hoarse little animal, a sore throat, tremolo guitar, there's organ tune, there's a bass synthesizer bass, bass guitar going boom, 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 boom. And there's a gong blast there, a gong, sleigh bells and bell tree. Mandolin starts here, but it's got rubbed off. He works more or less entirely on his own, well, in isolation down. and in peace. Next thing that happens, all this lot start timpani, loads of synthesizers, a rattle, claves, and three electric guitars, and synthesizers, six of them all going whizz, 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 at different times. There's that bit. It should be a dock rattle. I think that got rubbed off too. And yet he's managed to achieve great success in a medium which everyone seems still to think depends on things like oversell and packaging and product and promotion. Much of it does, of course. Most of popular music is like that. The medium really is the message. There'll be a gong here from Bosch. No, it's not there either. But fortunately, there are a few exceptions. There are musicians working today in the rock medium who have chosen pop or rock or whatever you want to call it as the best language the language that speaks to the most people to say what they want to say. Sustained guitar is a double speed guitar recorded half speed so that when it's speeded up it's really very And these are doing so without compromising their musical standards, without getting involved in all those things which everyone expects as so-called pop stars. With Mike, for instance, and, you know, I mean, he very rarely rings up and, you know, says, you know, how's sales going about? I mean, I've never known him ringing up and asking how sales are going or, you know, um, uh, I mean, he's never interested in, in reviews or, or features or anything about himself. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, there are some, there are some musicians like Elton John who, um, who, you know, are into it in a, in a, in a, in a business way, you know, and uh, into projecting, you know, a whole image, uh, which Mike happens not to be. Um, he's also, you know, like myself, he's not particularly articulate speaker and, and he knows what he's good at and he's, he knows what he's not good at and I mean he feels that you know he hasn't got a lot to say verbally I mean he feels he has got a lot to say musically. That's the first one and the other one is and the other one is. Their music may not be as yet that sophisticated but it's an important beginning. Anyway, I believe that a composer such as Mike Oldfield is among the, the best hopes we have for contemporary popular music. That's the second one. And they both fit together beautifully. What, what about it, didn't you like? What, the pop business? Yeah. It's a bit silly, isn't it? I think it is. Don't really get involved in it. What sort of thing? What sort of things are silly? Well... <coughs> um, I can't pretend at all. I 
unless I'm very drunk, then I don't pretend. I just make an exhibition of myself. But it, I suppose most of it is making an exhibition of yourself, isn't it? I'd rather just do it here. I think these young men have done more to harm our youth than any young people that have come around during the last generation, or during the last several generations, because people have followed their lifestyle, uh, the way they dress, the way they look, uh, which has made a sloppy, uh, dirty-looking generation. And I think we're beginning to move out of that. 